Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Thangam Debonair. Yeah. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am sure that members across the House will wish to join me in congratulating Sarah Clarke on her appointment as Lady Usher of the Black Rod. Yeah. She will be the first woman to hold this role in its over 650-year history, and we offer her our best wishes. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Thangham Debonair. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the BBC are currently broadcasting Drugsland, a documentary series shot in my constituency of Bristol West, showing the catastrophic impact of drugs and drug laws, not just on users, but on the police and innocent bystanders. So will the Prime Minister commit to watching Drugsland and to a Royal Commission on our drug laws, which are plainly failing? I'm pleased to say that uh, the Home Office, under my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, launched the government's drug strategy uh, only a matter of weeks ago. Uh, it is, this is, we recognise the importance of this issue. Drugs significantly affect people's lives, and sadly, we also see people dying as a result of, of drugs, taking drugs, but also the criminal activity that takes place around drugs. We take this very seriously. That's why we've launched our strategy. And Nigel Huddleston. Yes. Divorce and family breakdown takes an emotional toll on all those involved, but the family dynamic often overlooked is that between grandparents and their grandchildren. If access to their grandchildren is removed or blocked, uh, some grandparents call this a form of living bereavement. Will the Prime Minister therefore join me, Dame Esther Anson, and thousands of grandparents across the country in calling for a change in the law to give grandparents access rights to their grandchildren, as is the case in France? Yeah. Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right that, of course, grandparents do uh, play an important role in the lives of their grandchildren. We can all, I'm sure, sympathise with those who experience the anguish when they're prevented from seeing their grandchildren uh, if a parental relationship ends. Of course, when making decisions about a child's future, the first consideration must be the child's welfare. But the law already allows family courts to order that a child should spend time with, grand, with their grandparents. And I understand that my honourable friend has recently seen the Minister of State for Justice, and I'm sure that the Ministry of Justice and the Department of Education will consider the points carefully. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the new Usher of the Black Rod, and I'm really pleased it's a woman at last who's got that position. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I hope the whole House Mr Speaker, I hope the whole House will join me in sending solidarity following the atrocious suicide bombing which killed 50 people in eastern Nigeria. We should speak with sympathy for those that have, have lost loved ones and the obvious trauma they're all going through. Mr Speaker, the Irish Prime Minister, who has discussed Brexit with the British Government, says sometimes it doesn't seem like they've thought all this through. (laughs) So can the Prime Minister reassure him by clearly outlining the Government's policy on the Irish border? First of all, I'm glad that the Right Honourable Gentleman has welcomed the new Lady Usher of the Black Rod. Uh, I hope it isn't going to take 650 years before the Labour Party has a female leader. second issue that he raised, he referred to the issue of the attack that had taken place in eastern Nigeria, and of course, I'm sure the thoughts and condolences of the whole House are with those who have been affected by it. Now, he also asked me to outline our policy in relation to the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Well, I'm very happy to do so. I have done so on a number of occasions. We are very clear. We are very clear. First of all, that in relation to the movement of people, the common travel area will continue to uh, operate as it has done since 1923. And on trade and movement of goods and services across the border, uh, we will not see uh, a hard border being introduced. We have been very clear. We won't put physical infrastructure at the border. Mick Orbin. 
Mr Speaker, yesterday the Foreign Secretary said there can be no border, that would be unthinkable. Well, maybe, but they've had 17 months to come up with an answer to this question, and there still is no answer to the question because they have not engaged with the negotiations properly. There's another uh, person, Mr Speaker, who doesn't think the negotiations are going too well, and that's the Right Honourable Member for Wokingham, no. who was a very enthusiastic campaigner for Brexit, but also is a busy man, finds time also to be the chief global strategist for Charles Stanley Investments. And he recently advised clients to invest elsewhere as the UK is hitting the brakes. Prime Minister take advice from the member for Wokingham and does she agree with him? The, if I can address the first issue that the right honourable gentleman raised, we have been engaging fully in the negotiations uh, in relation to Northern Ireland and other issues with the negotiations, and indeed significant progress has been made. That's why, for example, I've said that's why I've said that we have got agreement on the operation of the common travel area for the future. He says we haven't put any ideas about the border uh, out. Well, I have to say to him, we actually published a paper back in the summer on the possible customs arrangements that could take place. We're, we're very happy. We're very happy to move to further detailed discussions of the customs and trading relationship we will have not just between Northern Ireland and the Republic, but between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Uh, that does mean moving on to phase two. And the question from the right honourable gentleman is if he thinks it's so important, why does his MAPs vote against it? Mr Speaker, the EU's chief negotiator said this week the UK financial sector will lose its current rights in the, to trade with Europe. It seems neither EU negotiators nor the government have any idea where this is going. Yeah. Last week, the Brexit Secretary said he would guarantee free movement for bankers post-Brexit. Are there any other groups to whom the Prime Minister believes freedom of movement should apply? Nurses? Doctors, yeah. teachers, yeah. scientists, agricultural workers, care workers, who? Yeah. I'm, very, I'm very interested that the Right Honourable Gentleman has uh, found that his uh, appearances at Prime Minister's Questions have been going so well, he's had to borrow a question from the leader of the Liberal Democrats, which he asked me, which he, uh, which he asked me last week. Perhaps, perhaps the leader of the opposition should pay a little more attention to what happens in Prime Minister's Questions. We have been absolutely clear that we will be introducing new immigration rules, and as we introduce those immigration rules, we will take account of the needs of the British economy in doing so. That's why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has asked the Migration Advisory Committee to advise on, as they always do, on those areas where we need to pay particular attention to migration coming into the United Kingdom. Uh, we want to get on to deal with the question of the future trading relationship that we have with the European Union. But we also, I am also optimistic about the opportunities that will be available to this country and about the deal that we can get from the uh, negotiations we're having. The right honourable gentleman can't even decide whether he wants to be in the customs union, out of it, in the single market, out of it. He needs to get his own act together. April, Mr Speaker, the Brexit Secretary was confident the European Banking Authority would be staying in London. Now he can't even guarantee banks having a right to trade with Europe. Last week, the government voted down, the government voted down Labour's amendments to protect workers' rights. The Foreign Secretary has described employment regulation as, and I quote, backbreaking and repeatedly promised you, and I quote again, scrap the social chapter. Why won't she guarantee workers' rights, or does she agree with the Foreign Secretary on these matters? We have guaranteed workers' rights. We've introduced introduced a bill in the House of Commons to guarantee workers' rights, and the Labour Party voted against it. Mr Speaker, the record is clear. This government voted down our amendment to protect workers' rights. The Environment Secretary... 
the Environment Secretary said he wanted a green Brexit, yet again Conservative MPs voted down Labour's amendments to guarantee environmental protection. On the 5th of December, Mr Speaker, the European Finance Minister's summit takes place to address the issue of tax dodging as exposed by the Paradise Papers. There are three proposals on the table to blacklist tax havens like Bermuda, new transparency rules for tax intermediaries and mandatory country-by-country -country reporting for profit. Will the Prime Minister back these proposals or is she still threatening to turn Britain into a tax haven? I'll take no lectures from the Labour Party on dealing, on dealing with tax avoidance and tax evasion. £160 billion more taken as a result of action taken by Conservatives in government. 75 new measures to deal with tax avoidance and tax evasion. And I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say that recently HMRC won an important case on tax avoidance in the Supreme Court, which means a further £1 billion coming to the United Kingdom. He may talk about tax avoidance and tax evasion. It's this government that takes action and make sure we collect it. Speaker, her predecessor blocked EU-wide proposals for a public register of trusts, and again the Conservative MPs have voted down Labour's amendments to deal with tax avoidance. Mr Speaker, when it comes to Brexit, this government is a shambles. Too many members are gesticulating on both sides of the House in a frenetic and, frankly, outlandish <laughs> fashion. Order! I say to the honourable gentleman member for Helian and Yar, he should order. He should seek to imitate the zen-like calm and statesmanship of the father of the house, <laughs> Mr. Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> I, have, I have much in I have much in common with Zen, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr Speaker, 17 months. Uh, I understand, Mr Speaker, the Tory whips are these days choreographing who to shout at who in the chamber. You're making a very bad job of it. Mr Speaker, 17 months after the referendum, they say there can be no hard border but haven't worked out how. They say they'll protect workers' rights, then vote against it. Yeah. They say they'll protect environmental rights, then vote against it. Yeah. They promise action on tax avoidance, but vote against it time and time again. Yeah. And, Mr Speaker, once again the Foreign Secretary offers his, his opinions, as does the Environment Secretary, saying there is insufficient energy going into these Brexit negotiations. You said it. You said it. Their words, Mr you Speaker, not it. mine. Isn't the truth this government has no energy, no agreed plan and no strategy to deliver a good Brexit for Britain? Yeah. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he talks about voting against tax avoidance measures. It was the Labour Party that refused to allow tax avoidance measures to go through in a bill before general election. So he should look at his own record and he talks, he talks about people taking different opinions. I might remind him that on Monday in the bill, uh, perhaps the Shadow Chancellor would like to listen to this. Yeah. Yes. On Monday, when we were putting through that important piece of legislation in relation to customs and taxation in Europe, 76 Labour MPs voted in a different lobby from his and his In this the party in this Commons that has no clue on Brexit is the Labour Party. Yeah. But ache in and week out, the right honourable gentleman, week in and week out, the right honourable gentleman comes to this House and talks down our country and is pessimistic about our future. Well, let me tell him, I'm optimistic. 
I am optimistic about our future. I am optimistic about the success we can make of Brexit. I am optimistic about the well-paid jobs that will be created. I am optimistic about the homes we will build. That is Conservatives building a Britain fit for the future. All, all he offers is a blast from the past. Assure people that this Conservative government is committed to maintaining the United Kingdom's strong commitment to the highest standards of animal welfare, both now and post Brexit. Well, I'm very happy to give my honourable friend that commitment. We already, as she and others will know, have some of the highest animal welfare standards in the world. And as we leave the EU, we should not only maintain but enhance those standards. Um, we've already set out our proposals to introduce mandatory CCTV in slaughterhouses, increase sentences for animal cruelty to five years, ban micro beads which damage marine life, and ban the ivory trade to help bring an end to elephant poaching. And we also recognise and respect that animals are sentient beings and should be treated accordingly. The Animal Wealth the Animal Welfare Act 2006 provides protection for all animals capable of experiencing pain or suffering which are under the control of man. But I reaffirmed my honourable friend that we will be ensuring that we maintain and enhance our animal welfare standards when we leave the EU. In Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Prime Minister tell the House how many jobs have been lost this week with the departure of the European Medicines Authority and the European Banking Authority from London. Yeah. Yeah. Honourable gentlemen, but of course we are seeing those particular two agencies leave the United Kingdom and go elsewhere in the European Union. But when he talks about the number of jobs being created, we have seen under this government three million jobs being created. That's a record I would have thought even he would be willing to welcome. And Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker, but of course the Prime Minister refused to answer the question. Let me tell her, just as she is aware of the cost of the hard Tory Brexit, losing the EMA and the EBA means that losing over 1,000 jobs. And the Bank of England have told us that the city will lose 75,000 jobs. Jobs are already gone. Jobs are going. Brexit is already biting. Will the Prime Minister recognise that exiting the EU is losing jobs and sector excellence from the United Kingdom? I recognise, as I said, that those two particular agencies are leaving uh, the United Kingdom. But the Right Honourable Gentleman talks about numbers of jobs being lost. I repeat, since the Conservatives came into government, three million jobs have been created. That's three million more people in work. That's three million more people able to provide an income for themselves and their families. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last year, housing associations generated £5.5 billion in cash surplus, money that could be used to build 48,000 new homes in this country. The accumulated uh, reserves that housing associations have come to £42 billion which would mean 36,500 properties a year for the next 10 years could be built. Will my right hon. Friend look at ways that we can make sure that housing associations use the money to build the new homes that people want, rather than having them sitting in the bank? My hon. Friend does raise an important point, and of course this whole issue of housing, and particularly homelessness, is something that he has uh, been a campaigner on and campaigned strongly on. But this is, in fact, already the approach that is taken by housing associations. They are non-profit organisations, so their surpluses are reinvested in the business, often in the next year. And In fact, for example, in 2015-16, their investment in new and existing properties was more than double the surpluses that they uh, that generated. Now, I have recently announced an additional £2 billion funding for, homes, for affordable homes, including for social rent. 
Last week, housing associations were reclassified to the private sector. That takes £70 billion of debt off the country's balance sheet, which means greater certainty for housing associations to get on with the job that my honourable friend and I both want them to do, which is building more homes. Dusty yeah. Blackman. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, my thoughts are with my many constituents who have got friends and family in Nigeria at this time. Um, Mr Speaker, the SNP has asked 140 <laughs> times for the VAT paid by our police and fire, sir- fire services to be scrapped and for the £140 million pounds to be refunded. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor said only last month that legally we would not be able to recover VAT and that the UK Government is now constrained by the VAT rules that are in place. Was he misleading us? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the SNP may have answered a number of questions, but of course the SNP knew when they took the decision to create a single police and fire authority that this would be the VAT treatment. Ito Hurst! Given the revised housing proposals that will force unprecedented numbers to the equivalent of a new town in what is left of Medway's Green Belt, will the Prime Minister give me and my constituents the assurances and the necessary large scale investment which will, uh, which will need to be made to boost public service infrastructure, which will have to cope with up to 100,000 more people? This is, this is, of course, an important point for uh, people not just in my honourable friend's constituency uh, but elsewhere. We do want to see more homes being built because I want young people to have the prospect that they are going to have the future that their parents and grandparents uh, were able to have to only owning their own homes. So we are going to go further in building more homes but she's absolutely right that of course as we do that we need to make sure the infrastructure is in place. We are putting in billions from central government for economic infrastructure every year up to 2021. That includes issues like transport projects, fibre broad Band connections, but we recognise the importance of making sure the homes are supported by the right infrastructure. Jane Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am proud that the last Labour government lifted more than one million children out of poverty. This government seems committed to doing the very opposite. With the Institute of Fiscal Studies. With the Institute of Fiscal Studies predicting that an additional 1.2 million children will be pushed into poverty by 2021, and that's on top of the 4 million in 2015-16, is the Prime Minister proud of her government's record of failure on this, and does she think this worrying forecast is acceptable? I have to say to the Honourable Lady that far from the way in which she has portrayed the situation, we have seen since 2010 600,000 fewer people in absolute poverty. That's a record low. 300,000 fewer working age adults in absolute poverty. And 200,000 children, uh, fewer children in absolute poverty. 200,000 fewer children in absolute poverty. What we've also seen, what we've also seen, is families getting into work. Nearly uh, uh, one million fewer workless households as a result of the actions of this Conservative government. Kirsten Hare. is aware Scotland is lagging behind the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of super-fast broadband rollout, with my constituency of Angus even further behind that poor Scottish average. A huge volume of my casework for one of my... A huge volume of my casework from one of my largest towns of our growth, where 20,000 of my constituents reside. It is hardly what you would deem a remote area. Can the Prime Minister confirm that the next generation of UK funding to support the rollout of Scotland's full fibre broadband will bypass that shambolic Scottish I'm very happy 
to confirm that to my honourable friend. She, she will know that we are making progress in Scotland in this, but we do need to go further. So programmes like local full fibre networks and 5G will allocate funding directly to local projects based on the quality of the bids put forward. And my honourable friend, the Minister for Digital, has recently confirmed in the House that for the next generation of technology, we will deliver it directly to local authorities in Scotland than going through the Scottish Government because we want to make sure we will make sure that Scotland is not left behind. Yasmin Qureshi! Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2014, an inquiry was set up to look into the drug Primados given to millions of pregnant women in the 60s and 70s which caused deformities and documents showing a clear cover-up. Last week, a report was published which was condemned by MPs across the House as being whitewash and misleading. Will the Prime Minister meet the victims and order a public inquiry so justice can finally be done for these people? You know, this is an issue that a number of members have been concerned about, and I recognise that the result of that review was not what some members and families were hoping for. It was a comprehensive, independent scientific review of the available evidence by experts. All the meetings of the expert working group were attended by Nick Dobrik as an invited independent expert from the Thalidomide Trust and at the request of the patient group, ACDHPT. And uh, the overall conclusion, I'm informed, is that the scientific evidence does not support a causal association, but that doesn't detract from the very real suffering that has been experienced by the families. And I recognise that these conclusions are hard to accept, but the Department of Health is focused on implementing the review's recommendations, which will strengthen detection and better communicate the risk of medicines during pregnancy. Even Hammond. Hey, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the right revised offer to the EU, far from throwing money away, will be worthwhile to secure the UK's future trade relationship with our European neighbours? As uh, I say to my honourable friend, he does raise an important issue. I set out in my speech in Florence that the UK will honour the commitments that we've made during our period of membership. We don't want our European partners to fear that they will have to receive less or pay in more during the current budget plan as a result of our leaving the European Union. But we can only resolve the financial implications of the UK's withdrawal uh, finally as part of the settlement of all the issues that I spoke about in Florence. Uh, but once that is done, of course, the days of Britain paying vast sums of money to the EU every year will end. Peter Kyle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every Prime Minister since 1946 has successfully appointed a British judge to the International Court of Justice. Why hasn't she? Can I, can I actually say to the Honourable Gentleman that the British Prime Minister does not appoint judges to the International Court of Justice? There is a process that is undertaken in the United Nations. We wish, we wish all the judges who have been appointed by the votes through the United Nations to the International Court of Justice well. Andrew Bowie. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend might be aware that in a Westminster Hall debate last week, members of the Scottish National Party declared that if the Scottish Government did not agree with the final Brexit deal, they would push for another independence referendum. This, this, this obsession with breaking up our United Kingdom is damaging the Scottish economy and causing uncertainty. So will she join me today in calling for the SNP to drop, once and for all, their obsession with a second independence referendum? I, the point that my honourable friend raises is a very important one. Scotland had a referendum in 2014. That referendum was legal and fair, and the result was decisive. The people of Scotland voted clearly to remain part of the United Kingdom. And, uh, and I think at the election they sent a second message that they didn't want a second referendum on this issue. So I say to the Scottish Government, as we, as we prepare to leave the EU, we should be, they should be working with us, with the UK Government, to get the right deal for the whole of the UK, not taking Scotland back to these divisive constitutional uh, debates of the past. And so I agree with my honourable friend that the SNP should take their unwanted proposal off the table once and for all. Nick Dakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Will the Prime Minister support steel jobs in Scunthorpe and elsewhere by guaranteeing if the current flexibility within the emissions trading scheme is not retained to March 2019, that she will act immediately to ensure British industry is not financially penalised? The Honourable Gentleman raises an important point about steel, and of course this Government has done a considerable amount over the last few years to support the steel industry here in the United Kingdom. I was very pleased to uh, be able to, earlier in the year, to make a visit and meet with steel workers and talk about the prospects for steel here in the United Kingdom. And we will, of course, look carefully to ensure uh, that the arrangements that are in place are those that are right for in the national interest, and we have supported steel in the past. Sir Crispin Blunt. Thank you, Mr. Can I take my right honourable friend back to the uh, first question asked by the honourable lady for Bristol West? And quite apart from commending the uh, quality of the BBC programme that she uh, re- referred to, uh, on the whole issue of prohibition of drugs globally, can I draw her attention to the fact that global policy is beginning to change and that the, in the face of the evidential failure of the policy since the 1961 uh, UN Single Convention on uh, Prohibition of Narcotics Drugs, and will she look at the evidence that's going to emerge in the United States and Canada on the legalisation and regulation of cannabis markets there, as well as decriminalisation in Portugal uh, and, and elsewhere? And open- Graverman of the inquiry from the honourable gentleman. We're, we're a little clearer than we were. And we're immensely grateful. No, 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 no. Quite enough. We're very grateful to the honourable gentleman, Prime Minister. Yes, well, I can say to my honourable friend that, of course, when I was Home Secretary, the piece of work was undertaken by the Home Office, which did look at the experience in a number of countries and the different ways in which they approach this this issue of drugs. But I'm afraid I do just have to say to my honourable friend that I take a different opinion from him in relation to to drugs. And uh, and I think that those who are dealing with uh, people who have been affected by drugs would also do so. I think of my constituent, Elizabeth Burton Phillips, who set up Drug Fam after after the suicide of her son, who was a drug addict. The work she is doing with families who were affected because a member of the family is on drugs, and the incredible uh, damage that that can do to families and to the individual concerned. I'm sorry I say to my honourable friend, I take a different view. I think it's right that we continue to fight the war against drugs. The Honourable Member for Chesterfield has migrated a considerable distance from his usual place, but we look forward to hearing from him anyway. Toby Perkins. Uh, Mr Speaker, people with the most severe disabilities have discovered that when they move on to universal credit, they're up to £100 a week worse off. This is because there's no severe disability component in the payment. So whatever happens about delays in the next hour, Does the Prime Minister realise that universal credit will continue to shame her government whilst ever it pushes the most disabled into the worst poverty? I say to the Honourable Gentleman that we uh, spend over £50 billion a year on benefits to support disabled people and people with health conditions. That's increased by more than £7 billion since 2010. Uh, and spending on disability benefits will be higher in every year to 2020 than it was in 2010. And as regards universal credit, as I've said in this chamber before, universal credit is a simpler, more straightforward system. But crucially, universal credit is helping people get into the workplace and making sure that they keep the mo- more of the money that they earn. Sir David Amis. Honourable friend, join me in congratulating the Leon C branch of the British Legion, local artist Beth Hooper and Mary Lister, on using a lottery grant for school children in South End to make seven and a half thousand ceramic poppies and display them on South End's cliffs. And would she agree with me? It's a further good reason to make South End on Sea a city. <laughs> Well, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in congratulating the Leon C branch of the Royal British Legion in the work that they have done in ensuring that young people actually recognise the importance of remembrance and the sacrifices, recognising the sacrifices that have been made by previous generations for our safety and security. And as to his second point, um, that's a very interesting bid that he's put in. I know Southend on Sea is close to his heart and he champions it all the time. And uh, I'm sure his bid will be looked at carefully. Howdy! 
Thank you. Um, Prime Minister, my constituent Hayley Crawley is having palliative care for bowel cancer and she needs a specialist cancer drug that's available for other cancers. She waited months to hear that her case for funding was rejected by NHS England and we are now waiting again to hear a reply for her appeal. Please will, you write, uh, please will the Prime Minister write to NHS England and ensure that Hayley's case is treated as a priority? Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, I'm aware this will be causing um, distress to Hayley while she is waiting for this, uh, this uh, appeal decision to come through, and I'm sure the Secretary of State for Health will look closely at the case that the Honourable Lady has raised. We have, of course, we were, of course, able to bring in the Cancer Drugs Fund, which has enabled some uh, can- uh, patients to get access to drugs that otherwise would not be available, but I recognise the con- concern and distress that her constituent will be suffering from while she awaits for this decision. The Prime Minister will be aware that under President Mugabe, British citizens living in Zimbabwe, especially landowners, suffered considerably. Can she give an assurance to the House that, as we see a new regime coming into Zimbabwe, the British Government will do all it can to persuade the new regime to treat British citizens living lawfully in that country treat them with respect and the safety and security that they should have, along with all other Zimbabwean citizens. Yeah. Yes. Well, my, my honourable friend does raise an important point as we see this uh, change taking place in Zimbabwe. And I have to say that the resignation of Robert Mugabe, I think, provides Zimbabwe with an opportunity to forge a new path free from the oppression that has characterised the past. We want to see a democratic, free, secure Zimbabwe where people across communities, if from communities across Zimbabwe are able to carry out their lives without fear, without oppression, uh, and we want to see that country rejoining the international community. Uh, We have obviously uh, provided some support uh, to uh, Zimbabwe in terms of UK aid, and as their oldest friend, we will do everything we can to support their change into a country that is free, that is democratic, that is free of all uh, oppression for all communities. 